Okay, hello everybody. Good morning. Johnny, are we good to go back there? Okay. Excellent. My name is Charlie Nunn. I'm at Duke University. I'm, I run the Triangle Center for Evolutionary Medicine, and I'm also the organizer of Club Ev Med. And as Jay said, we have a very special Club Ev Med today because we're going to be broadcasting this keynote, uh, this keynote talk today, uh, which is the first time we've done that. We have uh, just about 100 people registered online. Hopefully a good number of them have tuned in and are listening to me now. You know, we'll, we'll see how this all works. I'm a little nervous about <laughs> how this is gonna work. Um, but just a little bit of background on Club Ev Med. I hope everybody here knows about Club Ev Med. It's something that's organized. It's an event uh, that happens a couple times a month. Uh, we've had 80 of these actually. This is the 80th of our Club Ev Meds. And they occur online, they occur on Zoom. Uh, it's organized by the society, but also six different evolutionary medicine centers. And so it's a way to really coordinate among the different centers and the society. Um, they're recorded and online. You can see any of the previous 79 and the 80th if you wanna relive the event uh, today uh, on, on the Zoom perspective of the event today, I guess I should say. Uh, Johnny Ullman is uh, the assistant director of TRISEM and he runs, he's organizing this, he's in the back room up there um, waving to people and no one can see that him because their backs are to him. But he's up there and he's organizing everything and he will be taking questions from the Zoom audience and then coming down and or asking them on the, the microphone if there are any questions. And we do wanna hear from those of you on Zoom. Uh, please do post your questions in the chat box and, and uh, Johnny will ask them at the end. <clears throat> Okay, I think that covers most of the things I needed to say about this, but you know, the Club of Med has just been uh, a great opportunity for us to connect. Uh, you know, it started during the pandemic. Uh, it's a great way for us to learn, and I hope it really helps us advance the frontiers of evolutionary medicine. So with that, I wanna introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Maria Vila Arcos. Um, she is a professor in the International Laboratory for Human Genome Research at the National University of Mexico. Uh, she does fascinating research on cultural demographic and adaptive processes that have shaped uh, the, the patterns of diversity in Central America. And to do this, she uses genetic data from living populations and past populations. Uh, she's trained with some of the leaders in this field, in this field of paleogenomics, evolutionary genetics, including Tom Gilbert, uh, Carlos Bustamante, and she's really become one of those leaders herself. And so I'm really excited to uh, hear your talk today, Maria, on ancient pathogen genomes and what they reveal about the colonization of Mexico. Welcome. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you uh, to all organizers and especially Alejandra for inviting me. So, okay, let's start. Um, yes, yeah, so first, of course, I want to show you the faces of the people who did uh, kind of the heavy work of, of the projects I will, presenting you, I will be presenting you today. And to uh, dear colleagues, Emilia Huerta Sanchez and Flora Ye, uh, with whom I've been pushing the field of ancient pathogenomics, and uh, also my uh, colleague, Daniel Blanco, who is a virologist. So to give you an idea of where I'm based, because many people, when I tell them I'm from Querétaro, first they frown and say, like, Carry what? So, <laughs> Querétaro is a place two hours, three hours north of Mexico City. Uh, there is a campus of, of UNAM, the National Autonomous University. This is our, our, this is a picture from yesterday, actually. So, that's uh, where I'm based. And when I was invited to give this talk, I was uh, thinking, what could I talk to you about out of the different research lines I have? So, of course, I thought, pathogens would be uh, a, good, uh, a good point of start. And I don't think you are the audience who need to be convinced that studying pathogens is important. We've heard about uh, antimicrobial resistance yesterday quite a bit. Um, and, and I want to expand on that a little bit more. Um, we, we of course know that uh, uh, communicable diseases are one of the top causes of, of mortality worldwide, but especially uh, prominent in um, some, some countries like Africa and, um, and low and middle income countries. So, um, and um, well, this is, this is today, but we know that 
we've have uh, had pandemics for like throughout our history, right? This figure I, I like very much, it came kind of uh, in the context of the COVID pandemic, kind of to put in perspective different pathogens that have affected us throughout our history. So yeah, as, as humans, uh, as, as humans spread across the world, infectious diseases has been, have been a con constant companion. And um, these are some of the deadliest um, pathogens um, in, in the past. And what I want to show you here, oops, that came up weird. Okay, so these are some pathogens, for example, the Black Plague, uh, or different types of black plague uh, caused by Dracaena pestis, and this is a map of where, like, focus of of, of infections by uh, bubonic plague today. Um, another example here is smallpox. Uh, there was uh, there were several epidemics, uh, epidemic outbreaks as well in the past, and this is uh, some of the countries that still report cases of smallpox, uh, or that before it was eradicated, but um, here were kind of the last countries to have it. Um, cholera is another example. And here we were, yes. And now uh, flu, uh, swine, this, was, this is the map of the swine flu pandemic in 2013, but it's also, I wanted to point out the Spanish flu uh, at the beginning of last century, it also killed millions of people. So, um, of course, we can use this uh, time, uh, this constant coevolution and coexistence with pathogens in time to learn more about their evolutionary history as well. And in doing so, we learn also about our own evolutionary history. So what we do, or what my group does, is to leverage the power of paleogenomics to do that study of ancient pathogens. So I took this, uh, okay, you can't see the very top, okay, that's good. Um, uh, so, uh, I, I do paleogenomics, and to give you, maybe you've, you've heard of it, uh, it won, Svante Pabo won the Nobel Prize last year for, um, my screen is moving, it's doing things here, okay, uh, Svante Pabo won the Nobel Prize last year uh, for his work on paleogenomics and basically creating the field of paleogenomics. And, one of the reasons he uh, got awarded, apart from the many discoveries he did uh, with his group, is because working with ancient DNA is really difficult. So the methods to work with it and all the structure you need to work with it are very uh, are heavy. So uh, I want to give you just a glimpse. I could talk about the difficulties of working with ancient DNA for hours, but just to give you a glimpse, well, ancient DNA is very fragmented when we extract DNA from a piece of bone or tooth, it's very fragmented compared to modern DNA that you get from a fresh sample. Um, I don't know what's happening on my screen here. Uh, this is not moving and it just changed, sorry. Um, no, but also the screen changed. There's something there. Um, okay, now it came. Okay, yes, uh, okay. it's back, okay. yeah. Um, okay, uh, the, another feature is that it's, it's damaged. It, one of the, one, what we mean by damage is that bases in the DNA or parts of the DNA um, change. So I'm showing you here uh, an example. This is cytosine deamination. So cytosine induces an amine group and it turns into uracil. And this happens most often at the ends of the DNA fragments. Those are, that are um, kind of hanging ends. And this is a problem uh, when we want to call variants in ancient samples, but it also a signa it's also a signature that we in fact have ancient and not modern DNA contamination. That takes me to the next issue, and this is probably the hardest to deal with, is that when we extract DNA from any sample, most of it will be environmental, so microorganism, DNA from microorganisms that uh, were co-extracted with our DNA of interest. If we're not careful, we can contaminate uh, our sample with our own DNA or laboratory DNA, and that would be DNA contamination. And yeah, uh, just a very small fraction is what we call uh, the endogenous DNA, and it becomes really an issue, a problem of, a, of like a needle in a haystack situation here. So to uh, address this issue of contamination, we need special facilities and 
I'm proud to show you the human polygenomics lab at our institute. So what, all the modern DNA work is done inside this building here, and we have a separate room that has no connection whatsoever with the rest of the building with an independence entrance. And then we have uh, different compartments and chambers where we do different steps of the sample processing, recover of cells with body suits and take all precautions to avoid contaminating our samples. In this case, we are protecting the samples from our cells. So, um, in this context, I want to, uh, where are other ancient DNFs? I show you uh, my ancient DNA lab, and I want to bring a reflection. Let's see if, if it works, if I'm successful. So these are other ancient DNA labs in the world. Uh, here is, is mine, and there are others in other places. Um, this is a map of uh, present day um, kind of uh, geograph the, the geography of infectious diseases today, um, or, or deaths caused by infectious diseases today. Um, and this is a map that shows uh, samples used for ancient pathogen DNA studies. So where, where are these samples collected from? So yeah, there are some from Mexico, but you see where are most of them. And I want to ask you what this map represents, this over here. What do you think? Anyone, anybody wants to guess what's, what's this division? Hmm? I heard someone shyly saying, well, it's, um, well, it's the classic global north, global south divide, right? So there were kind of, my attempt here was to, to, to show you, well, yeah, the countries of the global south, for those who are not familiar with this definition, are frequently or uh, current or former subjects of colonialism. So kind of my warning here is that when, when, when the study of ancient pathogen DNA from colonial epidemic outbreaks is done solely by global north groups, kind of extracting samples from these places, um, a colonial pattern of exploitation is perpetuated. So that's why I think it's very important we study this process of, of colonialism with our own tools and perspectives in the global south. So that takes us to the colonialism, colonialism part of, of my talk. And why, um, why is it particularly important to study pathogens uh, and colonialism? Well, I want to show you the contrast of kind of the evidence we have for infectious diseases using just like bone lesions in the archaeological record in the pre-Hispanic population of Mexico. These are some, some examples we gathered. There's really not much. And this is kind of a, a dummy um, representation that my student did. And you can see the contrast, contrast with uh, the colonial period. And uh, there was definitely an explosion of of uh, outbreaks um, during colonial period and after European contact. So to give you an idea of how it looked like in central Mexico, this is the population and these are estimates of, of, of the number of the population who lived in central Mexico and how it decreased after, for example, the first very clear pandemic caused by smallpox, 8 million deaths. And then 20 years or so later, there, were, uh, there was this, uh, uh, kind of epidemic outbreak called Coco Lisli, causing the largest number of deaths, 12 to 15 million estimated. And then a second outbreak of Coco Lisli, uh, causing 2 million deaths. So we don't really know what Coco Lisli is, what the pathogen, we know the symptoms. There is uh, some documents that say how it was, um, what was the etiology more or less of this uh, disease, but we don't know what agent caused it. Uh, but it was a uh, hemorrhagic fever, very high fevers, a lot of uh, bleeding, fever, and some rash. And, and this happened really all across the continent. So um, here I'm showing you in this map places where there were epidemic outbreaks. And uh, according to this study, the calculation is that there were around 56 million deaths in uh, the 1600s and um, mostly caused uh, by pathogens, but also, of course, exploitation, colonization, stress, displacement, and massacres. So with this background in mind, our goal when we, when I started this project many years ago, our goal was to identify ancient pathogen DNA in pre-contact, mostly to contrast, but mainly we were focusing on post-contact samples. 
from Mexico. Um, so we started with a small sample set, um, and this gave us a lot of information that I will try to break down for you in the next slides. So we um, started with two sample sets. One were uh, archaeological samples from the Hospital San Jose Los Naturales. This was the first uh, hospital in New Spain that was kind of dedicated only to the indigenous populations. So that's why it's called Naturales. It refers to kind of Naturales, the naturals, the indigenous peoples of Mexico. So we got access to 21 individuals from this collection and another seven from uh, Templo, uh, Templo de la Inmaculada Concepción. It's in Coyoacán. We call it uh, La Conchita. And um, there were seven individuals here. And this is important also because it was the first uh, conversion center that was established in the territory. Um, and uh, through collaborations with archaeologists uh, and other colleagues, we got access to this and with permission by INA, that's the National Institute for uh, Anthropology and History. So the next part, the, the, the last part of, well, not the last, the next part of the talk, I will tell you about different results we got by studying this small data set. Um, so first, we, I, I will show you the results when we look for ancient viruses, then what we found when we look for ancient bacteria, what we're still doing with this data set. And then I want to close with, uh, with some opportunities and, and concerns. And I added this section after some talks yesterday because I want to bring some reflection to some, some points um, you'll see. So the first part of the virus screening, this really started with this brilliant student, Axel Guzman, who was an undergraduate. He's a PhD candidate right now at uh, the Icon School of Medicine in Mount Sinai. But he was an undergraduate student when he joined my lab and he said, I really want to study viruses. Um, I was like, I have no clue of viruses. I, I don't do that. And he was like, please just let me play with the data. And I said, okay, well, we might as well contact my good friend, Daniel Blanco, who's a virologist. So we took all supervise him in this project. So the idea uh, and what Axel uh, did was helping with the processing of, of some, some samples. So the way we start is we have a tooth. Uh, we uh, take the mainly uh, sample the root of the tooth. So teeth are vascularized. So there's blood flowing through uh, teeth. So we uh, extract DNA from teeth. We build DNA libraries and we sequence them. We do a first screening and then we break down uh, what we get um, by what is human and what is not human. And then what is human, we save it and we do some analysis on the human side. Um, and the non-human part, then we do a taxonomic classification with different tools. And from that taxonomic uh, classification, we identify pathogens of interest. If there's a virus of interest, then uh, we basically do a, a method, it doesn't matter the details, but it's like going fishing. It's like you fish out the DNA of the pathogen you're interested in from the library. And once you fish that out, you sequence it again. You map it against your uh, reference genome for that pathogen and do some QCs. This doesn't matter much, but what really matters to us is getting to this point where we have a phylogenetic tree and then we can make some inferences. So with this approach, um, and this could be a talk on, on its own, but to uh, bring it up to speed, we uh, reconstructed, we were able to recover four ancient viral genomes. Three genomes were parvovirus uh, B19, B19. So this is a human parvovirus. Uh, one was seen in, in Coyoacán, in a Coyoacán individual, and two were in the hospital. Uh, and one genome, one hepatitis B uh, genome. So we, um, we're very glad to see if this is a, a, a coverage. So this is how many times the, the genome is covered. Uh, yeah, this is how many times the genome is covered. So we have the three genomes here and covered at these depths, 3.9, 3.1, 15. And uh, as, you, as you can see, there's, there are peaks at the end um, so that was reassuring, in fact, because uh, the, the genome of this parvovirus is single-stranded DNA, and it has double-stranded loops at the ends that allow, uh, when, when this uh, virus replicates, it uses this as a template to replicate. So there are intermediate double-stranded DNA uh, fragments. Uh, so the fact that we got high coverage at the ends 
means that we were recovering actual virus from this, um, uh, actual DNA from this virus. And similarly with the hepatitis B genome, this is a circular genome, and for some reason this genome has, yes, has a double-stranded DNA genome, but then it has a single-stranded part and then an RNA tail. Why, don't ask me, I have no clue why uh, viruses do this. But it was reassuring, again, because our depth, as you can see, it also it's lower here where it's supposed to be single-stranded. This is just to say that we were convinced that we were recovering actual genomes from this uh, virus species. And also because I myself didn't know anything about uh, that there was a human purple virus. I thought it only affected cats and dogs, but turns out also affects humans. Well, I, I, I'm giving you some some bits of information of what this does, infects the precursors of the erythroid, cell, cell, um, erythroid lineage. It's quite common, actually. It's transmitted through the respiratory route, can be found in several tissues. Uh, in some kids, cause this uh, kind of rash on the cheeks called fifth disease. Uh, when it infects pregnant women, it can be pretty, pretty bad, cause, cause something, it drops fatalities that can lead to miscarriage and can also cause hepatitis and heart failure. It's particularly bad when it's combined with immunosuppression, uh, anemia or malaria, which is also a, a blood condition and hemorrhages. Um, so, okay, we, we have this genome and we put them in a phylogenetic tree combining with other modern sequences and other ancient sequences, everything that was available. So what we found that this, this colonial B19B genomes fall within genotype three variation. So what is that? Genotype 1, here sh shown here at the top of the tree, um, is globally distributed. It's found pretty much everywhere. Uh, I'm sure many people in this room have genotype 1 B19B. It's very common. Um, then genotype 2, it's thought to be out of circulation. It's only found in elders in Northern Europe, uh, but nowhere else. And then there is genotype 3 that is found in, um, in Africa. So our individuals are this these dots here. So uh, they fall within uh, genotype free variation, which, which is thought to, to uh, have originated in Africa. And something very similar happens with our HBV genome, the hepatitis B genome. So we find it in the A genotype, uh, genotype A, which is also at high frequency in many places in Africa. It's a red color here. Um, so we were, interested by this result and said okay well we remember we have the human data as well so we can find the ancestry of hum of the hosts themselves and we do this with a principal components analysis using the genotype information so here we have a reference panel of thousand genomes project where we have the africans asians mexicans peruvians and europeans and our individuals the v the parvovirus infected individuals to uh have uh are, seem genetically African. And um, the one from Coyoacan, uh, it's basically, and with more analysis, we can determine that it's indigenous, has an indigenous ancestry. And the individual uh, with hepatitis B, uh, it's also uh, seemingly from, from Africa. So, okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about two of these individuals. Uh, the uh, individual from the hospital, um, 81, he uh, is dated, we, we did carbon dating and we can trace uh, the, the date to kind of the beginning of the uh, colonial period in Mexico. He was a male adult and had the, the, the my bioarchaeologist colleague, Julie, he said, okay, this individual, before I told her the, the findings we had, she said, oh, this individual had something called uh, parotic hyperostosis and cribra orbitalia, which again, I didn't know anything about. So she said they are associated to anemia. And I was like, oh, okay, that's interesting because B19B, it's uh, also can cause anemia or be pretty bad if you already have anemia. Um, and notoriously also, this was the first time we observed this genotype in ancient samples. It, other studies are finding parvovirus in ancient samples had found only genotype one or two, and this was the first instance of genotype three. And another thing interesting, uh, another interesting thing about uh, the, this other individual uh, who had parvovirus is that this individual is actually probably 200 years um, uh, more recent. Uh, so it's not as old as, as this. And 
this has uh, what looks like a, an African parvovirus, but this individual is indigenous. So we believe that there was a chain of transmission, that the chain of transmission had to involve at some point an, an African um, individual. So, okay, there's another question we could answer with what we have is, okay, they genetically look African, their pathogens also look African, but can we really say where were they born? Were they born in the Americas or in Africa? So to do that, we use this amazing research, which is measuring the ratio of strontium isotopes. So just to um, show you here, I'm showing you two individuals. The, the, let me go back a little bit. Um, so the strontium uh, ratio you have in your teeth reflects that of the place where you were born and the one you have in your bone reflects that of the place where you are living currently or where you died. So we compare um, teeth and a piece of bone for two individuals and measure their uh, strontium isotope radios. And for example, for this individual in the tooth, we have this value which is uh, similar to that observed in West Africa. And in the parietal bone, we see an intermediate between what is observed in Mexico City and Africa. Uh, it's the same with this other individual. The tooth looks closer to what's observed in Africa and a finger bone is kind of intermediate between Mexico and Africa. So this is telling us that these individuals were uh, most likely born in Africa. And of course that has to bring us um, to the uh, notion that Mexico did take part uh, in the transatlantic slave trade. There are a few maps, and these I found, that have this arrow towards Mexico, but many times is, is um, ignored. Uh, but the truth is that there were uh, around 250,000 African individuals brought to New Spain during the first years of the transatlantic slave trade, and that's kind of in contrast with uh, around half a million uh, forcibly brought to through the US and around 4 million to Brazil. Something that is to me at least was uh, more striking when I started reading about this was uh, here I'm showing you a table of the years that the crown kind of make this census of, of, of the populations uh, broken down by uh, whether they were Europeans, Africans, indigenous or at mixed. And if you look at the African column, you see that for many decades, if not centuries, there were even more African individuals in, the, in this census than Europeans themselves. And you can see here the decrease of the indigenous population and the admix population starts increasing, but for at least a century, there were more Africans and indigenous individuals than uh, Europeans. So this narrative that we have in Mexico, that we are this ethnic mestizo race, because that's a term that is used of European and indigenous ancestry. Well, we can put that to test because uh, we were actually, there was more mixing between uh, Africans and indigenous people. So um, one, another thing that um, was uh, also drawn from this study is that my um, my student, and Axel, he for some reason uh, came up to these uh, autopsy records from Cocolisli victims in the hospital, San Jose. So here I'm putting a quote that say, uh, says, the fevers were contagious with green and black urine, the eyes and the whole body were yellow, followed by delusions and convulsions. The pustules behind both ears, great anxiety, blood uh, was pale green, uh, had swollen liver, heart with yellow liquid, awful it sounds awful right and the things i highlight they're related also to very serious liver damage and as i said uh, before well, we found hepatitis and parvovirus that also affects the liver uh, profusely so what we we are not saying that these viruses we found um were coccolisli themselves because they don't relate to most most of the symptoms but we are suggesting that maybe this coccolisli was not a, a, like a caused by one single pathogen but may, maybe there were different pathogens uh, in play and the one the two that we found can certainly be associated to liver damage reported in many of these autopsies but there's still a lot of work to do in this regard so kind of to summarize this first part um, the reconstructed genomes, 
uh, from the colonial period uh, fall within the African genetic variation, which is consistent with the genetic ancestry of three of the hosts. The fourth host, uh, host had native uh, ancestry, suggesting a transmission between people of different ancestries. Uh, which is also not surprising. And thanks to this strontium uh, analysis, uh, we were able to um, suggest that the viral pathogens were introduced to Mexico uh, or to New Spain then from Africa during the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, we also believe that B19B and uh, these two viruses contributed to the many diseases affecting colonial individuals being treated at this hospital. And something very important, and I will draw this quote from, from our paper itself, and I will just read it, because um, it's important to convey, uh, is it is important to emphasize that our findings should be interpreted with careful consideration of the historical and social context of the transatlantic slave trade. This cruel episode in history involved the forced displacement of millions of individuals to the Americas under inhumane, unsanitary, and overcrowded conditions that, with no doubt, favored the spread of infectious diseases. Therefore, the introduction of these and other pathogens from Africa to the Americas should be attributed to the brutal and harsh conditions of the Middle Passage that enslaved Africans were subjected to by traders and colonizers and not to the African people themselves. So we made this very strong point because we wanted to avoid kind of further stigmatization or associated diseases with uh, Africans. If you want to read more, this is the paper that was published. Uh, and uh, when, then we have a, a brief follow up uh, in the form of a review where we use uh, proxies as uh, sorry, viruses as proxies of different aspects of uh, human episodes, um, historical episodes in human history. So for the second part, I will briefly go through the bacterial screening part of this sample. So this is worked on my, by my PhD student, uh, Miriam. So in addition to those samples that I already mentioned from the hospital and Coyoacan, we had access to pre-Hispanic samples as well from different sites, those shown here in brown. And we also had colon uh, individuals from the colonial, the same individuals I showed before, in addition to uh, some others from, from Querétaro, from my state. So what um, the, the pathogen we, we found uh, at higher frequency was one called Cantanella forsythia. So these um, bars, what they show is the abundance of different bacterial species. Uh, I don't, don't worry about the colors. What matters is that is the ones in red that are bacteria, uh, bacteria uh, Tenerella forsythia, Troponema denticola, and Porphyria monagingivalis. And D means that they were extracted from dentin and DC from dental calculus. And these are the individuals from the pre-Hispanic period, from the colonial. And then uh, once we found this, um, uh, these hits to these bacteria, we went to the literature and recovered other uh, Tenerella forsythia, uh, well, other individuals with Tenerella forsythia from Europe. So this is how their pattern looks. So we can see um, these three bacteria. So we investigated more about this. So um, Tanerella forsythia uh, is an oral pathogen involved in periodontal disease. It's part of this, what is called the red complex. So it's thought that uh, periodontitis uh, progression starts from, yeah, from, from a biofilm. And then there's some dys dysbiosis occurs that favors the growth of the other have a bacteria that be, and then it, they, it becomes pathogenic. So they, uh, they act in synergy to promote the destruction of tissue. Uh, this is a, a, an EM picture of Tanerella forsythia. And here is your showing how this accumulation of bacteria can start really damaging the tissue. Um, so of course, well, back then there were no, no antibiotics to treat this. So actually the prevalence of periodontal disease in the archaeological record is super high. It's very, very high. Um, it's still a problem today, um, but less, less problematic. So we did um, everything that I showed you in the previous uh, part of the talk, but focusing on bacteria, and in particular, these bacteria, Tanerella forsythia, we recovered Tanerella forsythia genomes um, that were available, and we also built a tree. So what what we found in this tree? So um, here we I'm showing you 
uh, the, the, the tree and the colors indicate if they were colonial, in yellow, ancient European, uh, modern or pre-contact. And this is a funny instance where there are more ancient of, of a bacteria that there are, for which there are more ancient genomes than modern genomes. So we have more ancient genomes of Tanerella forsythia than, than uh, present day. So we can clearly see uh, that there is one cluster that encompasses the ancient European and colonial and modern ones. And there is a second one that has mostly the pre-contact uh, here is one European and one from the colonial period, but we see this kind of overall clustering suggesting um, that there was likely a strain replacement in the colonial period, because we don't find in, in any colonial um, times this kind of pre-contact um, strain. So, oh, yeah. So I, I want to draw your attention to this individual, of course, who is uh, of uh, dated to the colonial period. It's also of African origin, uh, but it clusters close, closer to pre-contact uh, individuals in Tay for Cytia. So, okay, this individual is very interesting because it has, in fact, this kind of what I call native Tanerella for Cythia, but you might not remember because it's difficult to see, but this was also the individual who had hepatitis B infection. Um, from the other uh, first part of the study. So this, we are talking about a co-infection in this individual. So um, a few things to consider when we look at this is um, that oral pathogens are transmitted by close contact. Uh, it's not a pathogen that, like COVID, that can spread in a room, but you have to have really close contact. Um, so it's been seen that it, the, it, there are higher transmission rate in cohabitation and high intra, uh, intrafamilial co-occurrence. So after seeing this, we start to, do, to think maybe oral pathogens can be used also as proxies to see close social interactions, right? If you share the same strain, like in the past, maybe you were, well, you had to be in close contact with, with that person. Uh, so this, this is something that um, came uh, like an idea and a future direction. But there are so many open questions. We see this uh, likely replacement, but we don't know if this was absolute. Um, and then we, we think that maybe there can uh, be infections by different strains as well. Um, not, maybe in the colonial period, we, one of these individuals had both strains, but with our method, we only picked the majority one, and that's why it fell in that uh, particular place in a tree. But we don't know, that's something we need to characterize. Uh, but something that we are exploring deeper into is, can we use pathogen phylogeographic information and host ancestry to infer close interaction between individuals of different ancestries? That's something interesting for the colonial period, of course. And if you want to read more, I invite you to uh, check out this paper by, by Miriam. So for the last um, 10 minutes, I'll tell you about uh, the ongoing work we have. So of course, this part of Tanerella Forsythia was very exciting for us. So we started exploring it further. So Miriam Bravo uh, collected, uh, well, gathered data from other places in, in the Americas, like from Brazil and from Chile. And we had this individual who had a lot of Tanerella forsythia, but we didn't have a date for it. But we still made a, built a tree, and this has less individuals because we just use whole genomes, like good quality genomes above, I don't know, about a depth threshold, I can't remember right now, uh, plus the Europeans one. So what we see is, it's interesting, this Brazilian one, which was post-contact, it clusters with the modern day strains. Uh, so it's, uh, it's ancient, but it's post-contact. And with the other modern uh, Tanerella forsythia genome that is uh, available, and the ancient European. So this cluster is quite clear. And here we have the Mexico ones that I showed you before, um, the Tanerella. And this Chilean one um, clusters right here. And if, I, if you remember correctly, I told you we didn't have a date for this individual. But just based on the placement on, on this tree, which what would you think about this individual? How could you put a limit on its date, maybe? Well, that's we, we had the same faces as you did when we look at this. Um, well, 
I said, well, I think it's pre-contact because it clusters with other pre-contact individuals. Uh, and then we finally got a date for this individual. And it turns out that it's right in the, con in the contact kind of limit, right? Um, so we, we don't really know. <laughs> the answer is we don't really know um, because, I mean, this is around the time that there was European contact in, in, in this part of Chile. So, um, but that's not the, the point. The point is that this brought me or this gave me the idea of maybe we can use the mutation rate of oral pathogens to date samples, like future samples. If we, if we are good at determining the mutation rate of these bacteria, maybe um, in, in the future we can actually leverage this to date the bacteria and have alternative methods for dating and have more resolution. Carbon, carbon dating, it's not good with samples that are more recent than the colonial period. So maybe this is an avenue uh, we want to explore. And uh, Miriam, because she is very curious, um, she she wanted to explore something else um, in her data. And um, we had this present. I show you this picture of this uh, mysterious coccolisle epidemic. And the the reason we were interested is because there was this paper that suggested that Salmonella enterica uh, maybe caused this major 16th century epidemic in Mexico, this is the Coccolisli one. So we, we weren't convinced uh, by this. This was published in 2018. And um, just uh, a brief uh, illustration of what uh, Salmonera enterica does. It, it causes parathyphoid fever in humans. When it's systemic, it can be really bad. It can cause hemorrhages as well, and maybe some uh, well high fever and some rash. But it takes a lot to infect, so it needs to have um, different uh, virulence factors to be effective at uh, infecting the gut. And um, it takes days, whereas these coccolisli, the reports were like people were dying within like hours or days. So this caught our attention because we, in fact, for some of the individuals from, this, uh, from Coyoacán, we found Salmonella and Terica, but these individuals uh, yeah, there you go. We, we recover the whole genome at 10x of the salmonella. But what, what is interesting is that this individual is dated to a period way posterior to the, um, to the epidemic, is dated to after the 17, uh, this is a calibration curve for, from the uh, carbon dating. So it's dated to way after, at least 200 years after the pandemic. Um, so well, of course, we built a tree because that's how we like to learn things about these things. So these are the individuals that were uh, sampled, the, the comparative individuals. And Miriam um, found that in the literature, there were also other samples that were associated to epidemic outbreaks by Salmonella enterica that are shown here with red skulls. And when we built our tree, this is what we find. First, this is, this is our individual from the colonial period, does cluster with the other individuals from Mexico associated to the epidemic outbreak. That's why they have here. So this is consistent. These are the other individuals that were associated to um, epidemic outbreak. All the ancient ones are shown here in blue. And um, what is important is uh, there are several, as I said, there are some factors that bacteria need to um, effectively infect uh, the epithelial cells. One is the formation of pili and one is to have this factor for bacterial addition. So we looked for these genes in the, in the individuals and found that in fact, these two um, that were associated to an epidemic outbreak have both factors. Uh, I mean, the story is more complex than this, I'm oversimplifying, but we found that ours doesn't have this particular gene. These two other associated to outbreaks, they do also have the pair uh this one who is not associated to an outbreak has the pair and these two only have one so what what we are really questioning is is if salmonella enterica really have the pathogenicity potential to cause, cause coccolisli or not and maybe something that could have happened is that if it did maybe this bacteria uh, attenuated its pathogenicity maybe by losing some genes and being more prominent we don't know. This is our, these are just uh, ideas that we are exploring. Um, and uh, just to show you where we are going next, all this is work in progress. 
we were able through collaborations with, with INA to get another 76 uh, individuals from the same hospital. And this is work my, by my student, Laura, whose work, who did a tremendous work. She selected the sample she did. She went like from the field to the analysis part very diligently. So here, it uh, doesn't matter what I'm showing, each column is an individual. Um, and each row is a bacteria. So we are finding hits to different bacteria. We are still exploring this. Um, and the color represents how many of the authenticity criteria they are uh, they have. So the greener the color, the, the better. So what we are finding is not as many pathogens as I would expect, but we're still refining this, this work. Uh, but um, a lot of oral pathogens in a group of of uh, individuals. So we will explore more of these uh, oral pathogens in these individuals, including Tanerella forsythia, but also others as well. The ones that are highlighted here were interesting because or, um, morphologically, the lesions suggested that these individuals had syphilis, but we didn't find any syphilis, uh, any Tryponema pallidum, which is the causative agent in this. So we are reassessing and discussing this with, um, with our bioarchaeologist colleagues. So to, to close, I just want to tell you some opportunities and concerns I have of this research and other research I've seen that is carried out in this uh, in, in your field as well. Uh, well, first, uh, yes, we know most infectious diseases have the highest death toll in the global south today. European colonialism caused major epidemics in the global south, and there is documental and archaeological evidence to target epidemic outbreak sites. So we can we can study these are uh, this is kind of um, the, the the background. Um, however, what we need to be careful about is getting ancient pathogen DNA. It's very difficult. Uh, so we need to screen many samples. So we need to be very careful. One is costly, and we need to, to have a criteria to select the samples. If you remember, at least in Mexico, this is part of our patri national patrimony, right? And it's a destructive analysis. So ne we need to be very careful to decide what we destroy. Um, and this is something I said earlier, the study of ancient pathogen DNA from colonial epidemic outbreaks in the global south solely led by global north groups reproduces a colonial pattern of exploitation. And there is also a risk of further stigmatizing populations as, as carrier of disease with this research. So we have to be very careful about, about this and other, um, um, and other things related to working between the global north and the global south. So we put together this piece. Uh, here are my colleagues, Mansa, Connie, and Maria Nieves, because uh, we were finding several problems in the field. And I hope maybe maybe you can relate this to your field or not. Uh, but we, we found that uh, there was a massing of ancestral human remains, or you can say just human uh, samples from global collections by a few big groups. We, we saw hints of helicopter parachute science in many studies. Uh, we found exclusion of indigenous and descendant communities from the academic narratives. And uh, it, this is, is very particular to our um, study case, uh, but uh, they, many discussions turn around NACRA, so the, the protection of Native American remains in the US. But what we felt that, it, that we needed um, to discuss beyond just NACPRA. So that's why we wrote this paper. And we came up with a number of recommendations that if you are interested, you can see here, because I, many people in the field of uh, biological anthropology said like this really applies to many of us as well. So um, one thing I can um, take away and give you, I'm about to finish one minute more, um, is that we, we suggested applying this local principle to, to ADNA research. And I feel, I believe it can be applied to um, every research that involves humans, and especially when there are these power dynamics be between Global North and, and Global South um, uh, institutions. So it's important to assess these global local interactions, really understand what is the local context and where it, where it falls uh, within a coherent global pattern. For example, local context, what can be the implications of the research to the studied individuals, what's the local heritage uh, regulation, uh, what is the status of the, of the field locally and what are the training opportunities locally, 
and involvement of indigenous communities. And while well, the global premise is something that we cannot be um, blind to, is that um, we need to look for sustainability, justice, aware that there's scientific colonialism, extractivism, and exploitation of global South nations by global North researchers. So kind of to compensate that, there are initiatives. Um, I'll, I'll end uh, very soon, like the Summer Internship for Indigenous Peoples in Genomics. It has uh, different, uh, it's now taking place in different places, Canada, Aotearoa, Australia, and USA. And I, I was very proud to organize uh, one in Mexico, although we changed the name to, but to keep the, the, the letters. And we included Afro-descendants in, um, in this edition. Uh, we were funded by native biodata. They also fund other things. And, and we are currently looking for funding opportunities for, for next year. And with that, I would like to end. Um, I know I went to different places very fast, but I wanted to share all this with you. Um, there are a lot of people to share, mostly people in my, in my group. Um, and the funding agencies, the Human Frontier Science Program, Welcome Trust, ICGP, and, and INA. So with that, I'll end and thank you and all, all the organizers and everyone online. All right, thank you very much. Uh, that was a fantastic talk. I want to uh, first turn to questions from the Zoom uh, from Club Ev Med. Johnny, are there any questions? And while he's coming down, I want to encourage trainees, uh, that students, postdocs, to ask some questions after we get these questions from the Zoom. Okay, so uh, question from Zoom from Kendra Shear. Do we currently not have any samples of T. forsythia for ancient African individuals found in Africa? Um, I haven't looked for them. Um, not that I know that I know. Publish, at least publish, no. Uh, but I also think that there is published data that haven't been analyzed in search for this, and there might be some. I wouldn't be surprised if there were some. Good morning, Ms. Fernander from North Carolina a and mm -hmm. My question is, during your um, ancient genomic sequencing, did you find any other bacteria that could be related to like certain STI infections like currently? Mm -hmm. um, no, no. Um, we did look for, for Teponema pallidum. Uh, we didn't find that. And we, I can't recall right now we found, but uh, definitely not, it was nothing, there was nothing there that could like pike my interest and be like, ah, oh, this one. Um, so I think the answer is no. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, great, great talk. I wanted to ask about the, um, I mean, the causal problem when you have this unknown disease. I'm afraid I can't pronounce it again. This, uh, this mystery condition, and you're finding microbes in dead bodies. I mean, the one thing that um, puzzles me is w whether or not these microbes are growing out secondarily to death. So they're sort of successional microbes that are opportunistically following. Uh, uh, death, or they're indeed causal of that death process. Any, any, any thoughts on that issue? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there is this notion of the necrobiome, right? right? So the organisms that kind of, yeah, uh, kind of, yeah, once the individual is dead, they uh, colonize it. Uh, but these pathogens, at least, they can't survive outside a living body. Um, so hepatitis B and B19B, they require to, to be part of the like blood production, at least parvovirus, for example, They're, they infect the erythroid cell line. So if you're not producing blood because you're dead, <laughs> you won't have this, um, this pathogen. At least these ones, no. There are other instances where we have phase pathogens uh, or bacteria, and we cannot say if they were pathogenic or just part of the microbiome. Thanks. 
Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, that represented a lot of work. Mm -hmm. I was surprised by one of your early slides where you had uh, illustrations uh, from the of paleopathology mm -hmm. from Mexico, mm -hmm. and there were surprisingly few. No, and there's so many Mayan archaeologists. Mm -hmm. They didn't find any skeletons. Uh, in in the pre-Hispanic ones. Yeah. So. It's way I put some examples. I just wanted to illustrate the difference um, visually, but there are very few examples compared to colonial period. I mean, there are um, uh, instances of yeah syphilis, as, as I showed this lesion in the skull is associated to syphilis, and also some uh, lesions associated to TB yeah, pre-contact. So there's actually a study uh, publishing soon about just TB TB in Mexico as well in the pre-contact period and a lot of oral diseases. But apart from that, it's, there's not much evidence in the, uh, at the level of oste osteoarchaeological or paleo um, pathological level. Paul Turner from Yale University, that was a great talk. Thank you. Uh, apologize if this is a naive question. I study emerging viruses of today, mm -hmm. which RNA viruses, of course, contribute to this. Yeah. So yeah, I can see you smiling. Is there any a priori challenge to looking at different types of viruses with different genetics? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Uh, yes, I didn't talk about that, but we're definitely interested in RNA viruses. And RNA, as you know, like the grades, like poof, right? So uh, it's very difficult to, to get it from ancient remains. However, we are trying to get some tissues where we anticipate we can get RNA. So these are um, tissues, for example, from lungs preserved in museums for like, they are 200 or 300 even years old. And we are being lucky, I would say. I don't want to, we haven't sequenced, but we have uh, extracted some RNA that's covering that uh, aspect. But another approach we are following because we really want to, we don't want to miss the RNA uh, part, we feel we're missing a lot of it by just looking at DNA, it's we are trying to recover peptides. Uh, peptides are more resistant. So if we manage to uh, identify viral peptides, um, are, or at this stage, even bacterial peptides as a proof of principle, then we have, we can open that avenue as well, like just recover the peptides from RNA viruses. Hi, I'm Fred Adler, University of Utah. It's a beautiful talk. Um, is there any other animals we can look at, domestic animals, that might shed light on the infections of humans? Uh, good question. So there were, uh, I mean, in Mexico, in pre-contact uh, period, there were not many, like, animals being domesticated or have. Um, but we could definitely look at armadillo, for example. That would be very cool. Uh, I haven't come across any collection that has an armadillo, but I'd be, that'd be really cool. Thank you for, for that. Yeah. No, boy, that's my CSM. Um, very interesting talk about, especially about the African influence. I work primarily in African paleoanthropology. But it occurs to me you have a, a very interesting, mysterious disease. It's cocolitzi, mm -hmm. right? Um, and and it, it ties off on this uh, question as well about other viruses. Um, you, you have this population coming from Western Africa, which is a uh, forest reserve, which has uh, essentially in the extreme west, very, very ancient um, record of, of human habitation and very many viruses, which include everything from Ebola to Bunya viruses and everything else. Would it would it make sense in your research to sort of investigate more on the African side of a possible source for this? Oh yeah, definitely. Well, I have colleagues who work in Africa, um, and I would if, if I found a setting where I could have African collaborators driving this research and me being a contributor, I would love to to follow up on that. Yeah. Thank you.